In this video, we're going to take some inverse trig functions by hand. And this is very pedagogical material. You'll almost never be able to do this in the real world. But the point of this video is to help you come to grips with what the inverse trig functions are and what they do. So when you have a statement about an inverse trig function, you're really being given two pieces of information. I've been working a lot with the sign, so just for variety, if I say that the arc cosine of some number equals another number, what is that telling me? Well, it's actually telling me two things. It's telling me that the cosine of B equals A. And it's telling me something about B. It's telling me that B is living in the interval we used when we defined the inverse trig function. The function was between zero and pi, and therefore B has to be living in this interval. And we can have statements like this for the sine and the tangent as well. The statement that the arc sine of A equals B really tells us two things. It tells us that A equals the sine of B. And it tells us that, that B is stuck in the interval we used when we defined the arc sign. I regret to tell you that with the amount this in these intervals are coming up, you probably do need to know that. The statement that the arc tangent of A equals B tells you that A is the tangent of B. And also that B is stuck in the interval that we used when we defined the arc tangent. With these statements in our toolbox, let's do an example from the textbook. Let's find the arc sign of one half. So the arc sign of one half is something. We could just plug it into our calculator, but we're trying to use this exercise to get a grip 
on these statements up here and just plugging it into the calculator wouldn't be very helpful with that. So what do we need here? We need a number who is a sign is one half and that's for the cosine and a number that is also stuck between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. And there are relatively, there are, come on, Zoom, work with me. There are relatively few numbers whose signs and cosines we know. Um, pi over three, pi over six, pi over four, pi over two, pi zero, and the angles that have those as their reference angle. So we can hopefully think about this a little and eventually remember that pi over six is a number such that the sign of pi over six is one half. And pi over six is between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. So we've found the number we're looking for. The arc sine of one half is pi over six. And let's pause a little to think. how we used this restriction. Because I thought about this a little, and then I said, oh yeah, the sine of pi over six is one half. But there are an infinite number of angles whose sine is one half. If you think back to the reference angle material, 5 pi over 6 also satisfies also satisfies this equation. That is it's true that the sine of pi over six is one half, but so is the sine of five pi over six. So for that matter, I'm trying to, there we go. So for that matter, the sine of negative seven pi over six equals one half. There are an infinite number of angles. There are Gosh, I wish uh, <laughs> wish this worked better than it did. There we go. There are an infinite number of bees I could pick that 
circled the wrong thing there, where they move the undo button. There are an infinite number of B's I could pick, such that the sign of B equals one half. So how do I know... How do I know that the arc sign is pi over 6? Why is it pi over 6 and not 5 pi over 6 or negative 7 pi over 6? Well, it's pi over 6 because pi over 6 is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And pi over 6 is the only angle between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, whose sign is 1 half. Let's do another example. Uh, with the cosine this time. Let's find the arc cosine of negative um, the square root of 3 over 2. So to do this, we need to find a B whose cosine is this. So what we need is to find a B such that the cosine of B is negative, the square root of 3, over 2. And it's going to turn out that there are an infinite number of B's we could pick that satisfy this. So then we'll say, all right, well, we're not looking for just any B. We're specifically looking for a B between a 0 and pi. And there will only be one B that satisfies both these restrictions. So this is maybe a little trickier. The square root of 3 over 2 ought to look familiar. And hopefully, if you dredge your memory, you can get once more to pi over 6. But this is not the angle we're looking for. Because the cosine of pi over 6 is the positive square root of 3 over 2. For the cosine to be negative, we need an angle in either the second quadrant or the third quadrant. And for the cosine to be the square root of 3 over 2, we want pi over 6 as a reference angle. And the picture that I have drawn gives us two candidates. There are, in fact, an infinite number of candidates. But just looking at the two lines that I've drawn, that first angle is 5 pi over 6. That second angle is 7 pi over 6. 
And there are an infinite number of other possibilities as well. Um, because remember that the cosine is periodic. It has period 2 pi. If we take 5 pi over 6 and add 2 pi to it, here's a candidate. We'll really talk about this in depth in chapter 9.5. But anyway, there are an infinite number of angles whose cosine is the cosine we're looking for. There are an infinite number of angles that satisfy the first condition. And again, this is where the second condition is going to come into play. There are an infinite number of angles with the right cosine, but we need an angle between zero and pi. And there's only one angle that has the right cosine and is between zero and pi. The arc cosine of the negative square root of 3 over 2 is 5 pi divided by 6.